My talk is about if carjacking can't stop the arts, then there are just no excuses. The arts have to have an audience in order to be sustainable and relevant, but that can be really difficult to get you when you're trying to engage audiences who've got diverse choices at their fingertips, and they don't even have to leave the comfort of their own home to access them. So my talk is about the Detroit Institute of the Arts, or the DIA as it's known, and the way that it's reinvented itself in order to get an audience. So I don't know if any of you have been to Detroit uh, recently, but if you can picture this, it's like a scene from a Hollywood movie. Um, your heroes walking along, armed to the teeth, the place is apop apocalyptic in, in its landscape. There are derelict buildings, Art Deco tower blocks that are empty, bits hanging off, graffiti-covered walls. <coughs> it's much more, there's lots of faded glory, but it's empty of people. And they are heroes walking along, and the only people that they see are kind of people who look like zombies with their heads down, wandering aimlessly across rubble-covered open spaces. And that was my impression of Detroit when I first arrived was really scary. So um, that was downtown and midtown Detroit and uh, the DIA is in um, midtown. And I thought, how on earth does anybody have an audience for the arts in this kind of environment? Most of the city's attractions are closed down because they just aren't the people to support them. A lot of people have left Detroit and the government subsidies have all stopped because the um, city's gone bankrupt. The cost of coffee, which is on your way to uh, the Detroit Institute of the Arts, has an armed doorman. So, so it's a little bit shocking. Um, but in the midst of this dystopia is the Detroit Institute of the Arts, this beacon of arts and culture. It's absolutely incredible, and it's got the second largest collection in the US, and it was valued in 2014 at $8.1 billion. It is an amazing collection. It's struggled financially over recent years as it's had its state subsidy cut from 16 million to zero, which is, is some cut. So, and its running costs have been traditionally supported through an endowment because, of course, it was once a very rich place. But the collapse of the interest rates and the um, fall in the endowment, which has gone from 350 million to 89 million in just four years, has seen it in dire financial trouble. The endowment now only gives them 3.4 million a year and it costs $25 million a year just to operate the DIA. So, in order to secure its future, it had to make some pretty dire financial um, decisions. So, it could either become the sleeping beauty of galleries, close its doors, mothball its collection and wait till better times, or it could get out there and do something different. So, it went on a campaign to gain a millage. So a millage is a tax that is on, a tax on property that in, in the States that people can choose to adopt. So they campaigned for two years at a cost of two and a half million dollars to win this millage. It's not a lot of money. People with a, a, an average kind of house price, kind of a $200,000 house in, the, in um, Detroit, would only be paying an additional $20 a year. But this millage would, bring it for, would last for 10 years and would bring an additional $23 million annually for the DIA. So they get it for a fixed period of time and it's, it's gonna bring in a fixed amount of money. They have to win it across three counties, which is many, many people. And um, they won it by half a percent in, in their own home county, which was the, the uh, it was touch and go for a while there. They faced such a lot of criticism from the local community because it is so poor. The area is so blighted by poverty that you've got this institution sitting in the middle of that and it's got, a, it's got 89 million in the bank. But the problems in Detroit are so enormous that 89 million dollars is just a drop in the ocean and isn't going to make any difference. So in order for the DIA to get this millage, they had to accelerate the development of their academically accessible art space. It belongs to the public, and the public had to really feel that. So the museum is now free to visit for everybody who comes from uh, any of the Detroit counties, 
And even if you are a visitor, it only costs you $8 to get in. It costs you 18 in Chicago. One of the biggest revelations when I went, and this is, was like huge, was the story, the, the collections were grouped by theme rather than by postmodernists, modernists. It was done by holidays, food, and gender, uh, family life, things that people can relate to. And um, the curators would go out to the community beforehand and actually talk to groups before they came in so that they could understand what their work was about. The programme has changed so radically in the last 10 years that it, the, the collection, it's not a collection-focused gallery anymore. It's an audience-focused gallery. And the biggest thing that they do is their DIA Friday Night Lives. So on a Friday night, this is every Friday night, the DIA is open. They have a beautiful theatre which seats well over a thousand people and it shows film. It's a beautiful Art Nouveau theatre. They have talks, classes for children and adults, live music, exhibitions. And I was really surprised by the diversity of the people that attended. They were all ages, all races and all social demographics. It was a family destination on a Friday night in the middle of Detroit with the guns. So I, ended, I went to the DIA with a lovely Scottish lady who was in her 80s called Mary and she'd lived in Detroit since the mid-1950s so she'd seen the changes, she'd seen it go from, from boom, bust, boom to bust and she lived at 8 Mile so for any of you rap fans out there that's where Eminem comes from. I went out there on a Friday night there as well and that was really cool um, but she took me under her wing and together we went to Friday Night Live and they were showing, I saw a Russian film with subtitles. And it was really busy. People were coming into the DIA from all directions. And uh, when you think about the location of this particular gallery with your armed guards and your, and there's just these massive open spaces of, you know, rubble covered buildings, uh, they, you can't stop at the traffic lights on a night in Detroit because you'll get carjacked. And that is, you, you'll take, in the UK, you wouldn't take your family out at the risk of carjacking on a Friday night to go and see something in the West End if you thought that that was what was gonna happen. But they do in Detroit. Mary had been carjacked twice at gunpoint, but she was still going to the DIA. So I think there is much to learn from the DIA. They go the extra mile. They make the program so engaging that people want to come out even at risk of life and limb. So as, a, as I run a gallery myself, I've got no hope of ever doing it on that scale because the DIA is vast. But the idea of somewhere cultural to go that's accessible on a Friday evening for friends and family without the carjacking, is something that I really took away with me. The guy who is in charge of the DIA is a, a, a gentleman called Graham W.J. Beale, and he's a British man. And I spoke to him about the revolution that he's done in this gallery, and he's talked about his wish to make art sing for the public, for them to engage with the work and to use their imaginations personally to interpret and connect with the work without being told. And his statement conveys more about access than just keeping the doors open. It's about making this incredibly precious collection relevant to people and for, to be considered by new audiences. It's a great example of really high quality work displayed in a really fresh context. It's not set up to teach you things, because I hate that when I go to places. It's not there to demonstrate something to me and kind of, you know, let me go, oh, wow. It's, going on a journey with me and together we're going to discover new relevancies for the work. I genuinely believe that the DIA is removing barriers for engaging with the arts and there is much museums across the world can learn from them. They want to use arts as a force for good within Michigan and even the threat of carjacking won't stop them. So thank you for the uh, Winston Churchill Memorial Trust for giving me that opportunity. My husband was really scared for me the whole time. Thank you.